Great. Thanks a lot. Oh. Uh, hi, my name is Thomas Nyberg. I probably should have put that there. But uh, yeah, so we're talking about mainly the focus is going to be how to write C++ extensions in order to use from within Python. And I'm going to give the talk mainly from a Python perspective, knowing that I'm here talking to C++ people. So I want you to be aware that I understand the irony. I have a bunch of code that I'm gonna be going off, and I just uploaded it, so it probably is downloadable and workable. If you're bored, I'm gonna show it to you, so you can also look at it on the screen. But it's there. So the point is, today, the, the, the goals that I have are to understand how to write extensions at kind of a basic level, but I mean like, you know, kind of understand it. Understand why to write extensions, and to understand what they really are. And the perspective that I'm taking it is that it can be really confusing to work with a couple languages simultaneously, and it can be also more confusing to learn how to debug it and work with it if you don't know what's kind of going on under the hood. I don't want to talk about CPU instructions, but I want to give you some level of understanding that can hopefully make it a little bit easier. So. The talk will start with very simple Python. That was what I was saying a second ago. It's not C++ we're starting with. The C++ we use will not be very fancy. I'm guessing that I'm on the lower end of the knowledge of C++ in this room. So I'm going to be using just Debian 9, and I'm using CPython, which is the common distribution, or the common uh, Python implementation and I'm going to just assume that that's what's being used. And basically the perspective I'm going to take is that this is the correct way to look at it, and if you have differences on your operating system, then use this as a guide to kind of understand it on yours. But philosophically, it should be roughly the same thing. So this is our starting point. A bunch of dots. So the point is, that uh, we want to draw a line that separates this plane pretty nicely into red and blue dots. Roughly in this side, you have more red dots, you have more blue dots on that side, at least it looks intuitively to be case. And I want to be some way specific in some sort of a, you know, actually rigorous way of drawing some line that can separate this into two good halves. This is the sort of thing you'll do, not usually looking like this, if you work in machine learning and advertising and stuff like that. So, now, the perspective that we have here is that we just finished a machine learning class and we know what logistic regression is, but we don't know that there are a million implementations of logistic regression, so we're just gonna write our own implementation of logistic regression. And that's what we're gonna do. So the point in listic regression is that you're trying to set up some sort of a mathematical problem so that the solution to this problem is that line. More specifically, you're trying to set it up so that you have some sort of a function, you know, a mathematical function, and the minimum of that function is what represents the solution to your problem. This is called a cost function usually. You're trying to minimize your cost. So, now, just kind of take a, some sort of a perspective. If you're in the Alps in Switzerland, which is not this country for some people who are confused watching, mm -hmm. but the point, if you're standing up, maybe at the top of the mountain, maybe not, and your goal is to get to the bottom of a valley, then one strategy is to find yourself standing somewhere, look in the direction that is steepest down, it's maybe here, take a step that direction, and then, now where you're standing somewhere else, you look around, you find the direction that's steepest down, you take another step. And you keep doing that, hopefully don't fall off a cliff, and you end up at the bottom of the valley. So this is the gradient descent algorithm. So we have some cost function, which for some reason is always called J, and... Does that just change? Okay, whatever. So we have a cost function, somebody's J, and we want to minimize it. And so the way we do that is we have some place that we're starting, and we're just choosing that at random. 
We are computing the gradient at this point. The gradient will basically be some vector pointing in the direction of the maximal change of your function. And you want to step in the direction that is making it go smaller. And so now there's kind of some important steps here is that when you do this type of an operation, you want to take a step in the direction, but you also want to know when to stop. Like when you find out you're at the bottom of the valley. You know, at some point, you know, if it's perfectly flat or just slightly off perfectly flat, you don't really know a difference. And so when your gradient, when this angle is really, really small, which is just some arbitrary number we're picking, we declare that to be, okay, we're at the bottom. Now, if our, uh, when we take a step, we're also taking a step that's sort of proportional to another random number. Like maybe I decide each time I'm going to step a whole meter, or you decide you're going to step just, you know, a foot, which maybe you don't know what that is, but I do. And so if you do that, you want to have these numbers that are kind of floating around. There's some number that st is a stopping condition. There's a number that determines how far you step each time. Okay? And this here is the goal. This is what we want to get to. So let's get a little more specific here for a second, since we're going to be talking about data and things like that. Our input data that we're starting with are pairs of points. These are Cartesian coordinates. X and Y, they will look something like this, pairs of points, 1.3, 5.2, you know, whatever. And then we have these labels, which are minus one or one, which to me is corresponding to red and blue, but I'm just kind of picking this kind of arbitrarily. And so what we're basically doing is we're, we're looking at different coefficients for this. This defines a line in the plane. If you remember your geometry. And so we want to sort of solve for these different, okay, I didn't mean to, uh, that b should be another random number. But the point is that this is a constant, that's a constant, and that's a, b is a constant, and we're trying to find the very best ones, okay? So, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get away from all of this uh, high level kind of intuition of the actual gradient descent and like that, I'm just going to assume that is understood, okay? And I'm going to jump into an implementation here, and I'm going to just point out the different pieces because we're going to iteratively turn this into C++. So uh, my class, which doesn't even have to be a class, it could be a function, but I'm just doing it as a class because this is C with classes, is this is, uh, I have some constants, this constant is this uh, small step size I'm taking each time. This epsilon is this decision about when I stop. That's how it corresponds. This iterations problem is that depending upon how, you know, irritatingly, um, uh, depending on your function, you might take like an enormous amount of steps. And you might just get bored and we want this thing to just say, okay, after 100 steps, we declare we're at the bottom and we just say we're done. For us, it's more important that we actually, you know, finish our algorithm than we actually do anything else. Now, the coefficients that I want to find, I'm calling a1, a2, and b. Those were those three in this other page. And I'm starting those at zero, because for me, it doesn't actually matter where I start. So now, what this is doing is, I am, for up to 100, this is not like, you know, whatever, up to 100 times, I'm going through this loop. And the first thing I do is I compute a gradient which gives me three numbers, which is a direction that it's pointing. I check if these three numbers, this is taking the Euclidean norm, so I basically just add up the size of the vector, basically. I check if they're smaller than epsilon. If they are, that means that I'm at a place where I have a really small angle. I just declare it to be the bottom. I break and I'm done, and I return these values, which I haven't even updated in this loop. If I do not fail, so I do have some angle, then I'm going to uh, step in the direction of the gradient, this delta is just the, this small step size times what the gradient is. That's what this number is right here. This minus is just because we, we want to go downhill and not uphill. Okay? So, now the important thing is that right now here we're calling this compute gradient function in every time we go through this loop. So if we go down here, now this is the other method that I cut off. Here's our compute gradient function. In this function, uh, 
This is just kind of a mathematical detail, but we have some sort of uh, starting point of a regularization term. And then I'm doing some fancy, nice unpacking of variables because Python is beautiful at times. But the important thing to know here, two things. This is a for loop. Remember, this function is called in another for loop. So we have a for loop, and then inside that we have a nested for loop. The other thing is that this is a bunch of arithmetic and mathematics and stuff like that. And this function, if you look down here, is this logistic function. It's just some fancy version of an exponential function. Math.exponential plus one inverse. And so everything that's going on here is just some sort of a standard mathematical computation. And this is just arithmetic. And this is, uh, well, you know, exponential. So the point is, that nothing in this entire operation is doing anything fancy that requires Python, really. And there's also nothing that is going on here that our CPU can't do really, really, really fast. So, let me see, okay. Now, let's go over here. So, I wanna look really quickly and just kinda give you some, uh, by the way, you know, Python, so we can just do this. I import data. I'm going to do things like this. Generate data. Five. I want, actually I want to say, say four data points. Say minus a third, minus a third. It's kind of arbitrary. That's ugly. So it's what I showed you on the slide. That's it. Here's our points. There's our labels. OK? So let's go out. Now, if we look at this pot points, this is another reason why you might like Python. Here I just did this, this line. I generate some data. Uh, I do some irritating stuff that I might want to do for uh, this specific library, matplotlib, is I want to label these things red and blue according to the necessary format. And then I just go plot, plot, uh, save fig. And if I run this, which is just Python on that, it gives us the data. So this is one of those nice reasons why it can be nice to use Python. So let's go back. So in pure Python, this is just what I was showing you. That's it, OK? This is what I just walked through. And when I plot the decision boundary, you should notice the only difference here is that I have to go through, I plotted the picture, but I have to go through some process to solve for some lines. This is, you know, solving for the line, giving, given the, we, we solved, so we, we instantiate a model, our logistic regression model. We have our data, we fit it to at the top. Here are the coefficients, these are the, the, the resulting coefficients. Then we go through and compute two points based upon this line and we plot those two points on the line of the picture that we already had. And so, if we run that, we get this sort of thing. Here's one, there's one there. So, this right here is, um, you know, this is enough, right? Like, we have a picture, we have a line, and so we're done. Well, no, probably, the boss doesn't like that. We're probably going to need to be a little bit more, uh, you know, careful. But so let me say that what I want to show you in a second is I'm going to show you some tests that do some comparisons. And let me uh, go in there right now. So first, let me actually jump into this uh, the C++ portion. So if we look at C++, what do I have? This is probably not necessarily the fanciest thing that's going on here. There's probably better ways to do all this, but if you notice, look at this, it's the same algorithm. Some things are a little bit longer because I chose the way I chose to do it, it goes across the screen, but it's the same exact algorithm. There's really like nothing different going on here. There's our standard exponential, there's our little thing there. This is the same thing. So now the question is, we have this thing, this is C++ code, what do we do? So, well, we need to compile. So if we can compile it, 
because it's doing a bunch of crazy compilation stuff, throwing it up here. And let's look what we have here. This nice green file just showed up. Has an SO at the end. This should sort of give everyone who kind of knows this sort of thing uh, some idea of what's going on. Python, import LR CPP. Uh, when I go LR CPP dot file, it really, it really did come from this long file. It has this SO right there. Now, if I want to do uh, import data, and then I wonder if I can do that. Nope. I really should have default arguments here. Let's do, we have a model. And then we do something like compute coefficients, oops, model dot compute coefficients, x, y. Boom, it gives us some numbers. So this should already be kind of exciting. I mean, like, you know, we're calling C code right now. And I mean, I'm not, this feels much better. I like working with uh, or C++, I like working with C++, but being able to do this is really nice. So what we can also do is, you know, we can look and do a test here. So I have, let me see, I have this program called PyTest. I have some data. This is the data rate data. I'm importing my two implementations, my Python implementation, my C++ implementation. And now I'm not doing a very, what do you call it, a very smart test here, but I'm just generating a whole bunch of different parameters. I'm throwing it in. And then I am writing a test to verify that they compute the same thing. So if I do this, make test, you know, it passes. So um, now let's run a little profiler to kind of compare what goes on. So I'm going to just, I have a fixed job and I am running it once with uh, the pure Python version and once with the C++ version. And the two codes look almost exactly the same. For some reason, I chose more jobs than I probably needed to, but uh, it's almost ready. Okay, so the C++ version is a little bit faster. In fact, most of that was just the Python version running, and the C++ one took a second. So I'm not even showing you the specific numbers here because I haven't even yet really tried to optimize anything. I mean, all I've done is basically do almost a, like just a rewrite of the C++ or, or of the Python, make it compile as C++, and then that's our now new class. So now, by the way, this whole process is already kind of really useful because I'm showing to you this as if I sat down and just wrote down this logistic regression class like this. Of course, I cleaned it up as it went on. The first time I wrote it, it had all these issues, and I was comparing it to another library. And to do that iterative comparison, it's so much nicer to do it in Python, to sit there and figure out that your algorithm is actually correct in something where you can hit it back and forth. And then if you can convert it straightforwardly into C++ and then have this thing that you can compare against using your tests, you now have a way to just make it work in C++ and then boom, it ends up being way, way, way faster. Which for you guys is not actually a huge thing because you already live on that side. So that's kind of like, I cut my legs off, and then I tell you your legs are great, and then you say, I know, I already have them. But, but the point is that really taking it from another perspective, you can take C++ code and you can use it in Python. And we're gonna keep going down that route. So, uh, make sure I don't have anything else I wanna hit here. Nah, that's not important. Okay, well that's maybe giving you the idea of the next thing to go. So let me first go over here and look at my, uh, for, for my C++, 
that if we looked at that algorithm, what we were doing was we were doing this outer for loop, and then on the inner for loop, we were basically just running down the line of a bunch of data and then just doing some mathematical computation that did not actually, if you stare at it, matter about any global, anything outside of the scope data. It was just a streaming mathematical operation, which means that you can do the streaming mathematical operation starting at the top and the middle at the same time, or at the top and the middle and the third and the fourth and just running down, and then you can actually use all of the cores that you probably have in your computer. So, let's look at that real quick. Uh, this portion looks exactly the same, and that's because this compute coefficients is, some, is the outer for loop that I'm not doing anything with. Here, I'm doing this in roughly the easiest way I can possibly come up with, which for a second might look a little bit more confusing. I'm defining this, this function, this reducer function, which is doing the same thing that was being done before, it is now using a uh, mutex in order to protect against the race condition when I update the main, these, these partials, I have to update them in a way not to you know, have any issues. And then when I run the actual function down here, I'm just basically take the data, I'm just splitting, if I take four, have four threads on a run or eight threads or whatever, I'm just splitting up the data into those chunks and then I'm running the reducer on those chunks and then in the end I'm finally actually just, you know, generating these threads and letting them join. I'm not doing anything smart. I'm not reusing threads. I keep <coughs> generating a new set of threads every single time because I don't at all want to think about this in, you know, in any way to make it more confusing. This is just every for loop, generate a bunch of threads, run this function, you know, join on the threads, and then do it over and over and over again. And so, well, we've done this. Why don't we run a test suite? Oh, I guess I have to compile it. A little bit annoying. This we don't have to do with Python. Ha. Okay. Anyway, that's a bunch of meaningless stuff, but the point is that the threaded stuff is still giving me the right, the right values back, so I probably don't have a race condition. I usually fail a little bit faster. Now if we look at, the, look at a profiler, um, I thought this one was faster. That is bizarre. I have never seen that. <laughs> so, okay, no, I want to be clear that there's there's actually a portion of this. Let's so this actually, this was supposed to do this. I'm going to explain in a second. I'm going to run that one more time just to see. Uh, okay, so it doesn't actually just get better. And I don't know 100% why, but I have my theories, which I'll go into. Uh, but uh, it definitely has never gone that badly. <laughs> so let's see what happens real quickly, if I can generate it. Yeah, this is bizarre. Okay. So <clears throat> what I noticed, actually, to kind of tell you now, I was going to tell you later, but now you won't trust me if anything I say from now on if you don't look at this. But the point is that um, it's not something like inefficiently generating threads or anything like that. Uh, one thing that, that I notice when running all these different tests, actually, is that if I run my CPUs like at 100% and I, what will happen is the CPU will speed up and you can look at the, the debug messages telling you that your CPU is throttling itself. It's getting out of bursty mode. And so what would always happen is I would like drop for a little bit and then I would kind of go a little bit back up, and then it was really hard for me to, lo for me to uh, localize it. Now, it's never happened this much, which might be because I'm video recording on this computer, might be because I'm a charlatan, I don't know. But the point is that this is actually pretty hard to um, get right. Now, we're going to come back to this, because there's higher level reasons why you shouldn't believe this has anything to do with Python. But uh, but honestly, it's, it is bizarre, but we'll get back to that. So 
That was not the way I wanted to put it, but let's see. So let me actually just really quickly take a step back and say, how is it that this is even happening? So we have this class, which is inside of this lr.cpd file. And then I want to actually, I want to somehow pull it in from Python. And so let's look at the code that does that. That's pretty crappy, huh? It's pretty long and complicated. So, all right, what's happening? I'm just, this, by the way, firstly, this is C++. I mean, it's C++ with some, it's pulling in some header files that are doing some magic that does this. But I mean, at the end of the day, it's, uh, it is C++. And all I'm doing is I'm defining that I have some initialization function. I'm telling it that there is a method that I want to call compute coefficients. I'm pointing that method at the actual implementation in my class and everything else comes for free. That's it. That's the only thing I'm doing. So what I'm using here is this library called PyBind11. It's a really nice library. There's a lot of libraries that do the same sort of thing. Uh, people have their really strong opinions upon which one's best. I don't have a strong opinion. This is really nice. I like it. Uh, but the point is that if you just take a step back and just forget about that and just look at what we have to do here is that this is all we have to do in order to take our C++ code and make it something that Python can understand. So this is something that you can do as well. So now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here. Now, for some reason, that's, a, so that's the same exact file. Let me check that. That could make me feel a little bit better. Oh no. I added in the thread parameter. So that's the only difference that I did for the second one. Is that I added in, this is not actually that it's one, it's just saying the default is one. That would have been nice if that saved me. but. Um, but this is all I'm doing in order to uh, export the information that I need to pass some number of threads to my class. And if I want to just make it, you know, one is the default, then I'm, then I'm good. In fact, if I go like this, and I just write, let's go like yeah, that. So this is automatically generated help stuff. So it's not going to ever be magical. But it is telling you. Uh, right there, for example, the dumb threads is an integer that's default one. It's telling us that we have some method here, and all of this comes for free from PyBind11. Okay? So, now, what I'm going to do with this version here, so let's look at this profile function class real quick. Oops. So what am I doing? Is I'm, remember, generate data just generates a bunch of data. <coughs> obviously. And so what I'm doing is I'm generating a bunch of data and I'm appending it to a bunch of jobs and then I'm defining some worker function which all the worker function does is it grabs the data and it just computes the coefficients on the model. And then when I profile it, what I'm just doing is I have my whole set of jobs, I take my number of threads, I instantiate a logistic regression class using that number of threads and then I just run over and over again through all the jobs. I try to run them as fast as possible. So I view this as like throughput of computation, okay? This is just building graphs and stuff like that. This is the whole, this is the whole actual kind of job. Now the point is that nothing here is using threads inside of Python. And so if we want to use threads inside of Python, then let's look at uh, another profiler. It looks very similar, but the only difference here really, I have basically the same worker, although I decided to make a global uh, class this time, which doesn't matter, although you should kind of wonder, but it doesn't matter. And this time I'm creating a thread pool, and I'm having that thread pool with these functions work through and try to run through the number of jobs as fast as possible, okay? But these are, these right now, this is a single threaded class, 
but I instantiate, say, four of them. And so now if I run this profiler, so maybe quick, does someone expect what to happen? Does anyone have any idea? Say, load up. We have everything covered. <laughs> so I don't know what's going on with two, but uh, this one right here is actually doing uh, exactly what I expect if we cut this one off. And the reason why this is happening is that we are using right now Python threads in order to do our concurrency. And if you pay any attention to the people who don't like Python, the thing you will eventually hear is people talk about the GIL, the Global Interpreter Lock. And so right now, what's happening is all of our concurrency is coming from Python, but Python has a global interpreter lock. And so what we want to do is we want to get around that because this is no good. I have more than one CPU in here, even if we ignore the other graph that seems to say I have like negative two CPUs. So now the point is that we want to somehow uh, make this work without, um, we want to add the concurrency into the Python side of the code. And so if we look at our new export function, so trust me for a second, everything is exactly the same, except for this, right there. I have this call, this weird thing, pi call guard, sculpt, gill, release, whatever. Okay, that's the only thing. Let's make profile pi threads. And look at what actually happens. So if you notice all the blue, I've written everything actually so that it's all symlinked kind of to the folder before. And I'm doing it all in a way that you don't have to use virtual environments or anything like that because I don't I want it to be just kind of as brain dead as possible. But if you looked at that screen, the only thing that was different was the export function. And the only thing that was different in that one was that pi sculpt release. So, this is super irritating. <laughs> so, this is what it should look like. And this one always does. Well, actually, it breaks off here. It goes like this to about four, and then it flattens. But it goes like this. I'm gonna to totally unplug this thing in a second and I'm gonna generate some good graphs for you. But, all right. So, this is the worst, this is the worst exit the demonstration ever. But uh, <laughs> right now, the one thing I would hope you at least kind of, well, even that's hard to say. I'd like you to believe that the threaded implementation is doing something, okay? We're gonna to have to take a step back to like kind of, you know, I could, I could like maybe uh, start looking at syscalls in order to kind of demonstrate that for you, but um, let me uh, kind of like take a step back and then we're gonna kind of talk about what's actually going on there and why that shouldn't be happening and why, uh, I don't know why it's happening, but why it shouldn't be happening. So the implementation summary, you know, we're, no, I don't care about this. So this is the actual point that I care about. What is a CPython extension? So a CPython extension is a shared library with a bunch of code. This code is basically anything, and the only real requirement that this code has is that it has certain functions that are exported into Python. So let me go back here for a second, and let me do this. Sorry, that's not right. LD. LD debug. Yeah, it should throw all this stuff. It's telling me when different dynamic libraries are loaded. And now if I import LRCPP, are you kidding me? Ugh. You see what happened is that the importing of Python is actually using the <coughs> dynamic loader for Linux in order to find the file and pull it in. It's calling an initialization function, and that's what's going. 
So this thing is, it's using the regular types of dynamic loading that's used in C and C++ in order to implement Python's dynamic loading modules, if they're extension modules. So the only real requirement is that it has an initialization function which calls into the Python API and initializes all the functions that you want. So let's take a little picture here. So we have Python. It is probably separated into actually its own shared library or something, but don't worry about that. Think about it intuitively. This is some process, not a process, but it's some block of code. This block of code has dynamically linked uh, shared libraries in its process space, like libc, libdl, and stuff like that. Now, let's, tell you, let's look at what the gil is. So when this this block of code is running. This block of code, basically, for every single Python API call, or Python internal API call that's going on, is its thread unsafe. And this is not by accident. You know, they are smart, and they're aware of this, and they're also aware of that it can annoy people. But the fact is that it's thread unsafe is because all of the internal data structures, they're using things like memory allocators that are thread unsafe, and other aspects. But the point is that in order to run call any API functions in Python, you have to hold a lock the entire time, this global interpreter lock. So the way that Python works is that, you know, bytecodes are coming in. It takes a bytecode, it says, okay, in order to service this bytecode, I have to run these five different APIs. These APIs all require the global interpreter lock to be held. It gets the next bytecode, it, it runs those ones, it has to hold the lock. And so it just continually holds the lock all the time. But libc, libdl, they don't know anything about Python. And so, you know, when you're executing code inside here, there's no way this code, I mean, this code is not going to reach in and change Python's data structures. And so you don't need to have this lock held when executing code out here. And so when you go into this area, the first thing that you do, in almost all circumstances, is you release the lock, you release the gill. So for example, if you open a file, which might be on a file system on the other side of the earth, so it could take arbitrarily long, you release the lock, you go in there, you open the file, it comes back, and once it enters, it tries to grab the lock again. So, let me go here. You leave the Python interpreter, you release the gill, if you want to come back in, you acquire the gill again. Okay? Now, if you have a module, an extension module, all it is is it's just another shared library that's loaded at runtime. You're writing this module. And so the first thing you can do when you go in the module is you can tell Python that I don't need your data structures, I release your global interpreter lock. And what that then means is that if you have multiple threads running in Python, these threads can then actually, you know, this one, this thread goes on its merry way, this other thread can now start running around the interpreter. And so, what's the upshot here? If you're C++ programmers and you're willing to release the gill, you know, you're willing to write, I should say, you're willing to write an extension, then releasing the gill is easy and it basically doesn't matter. So if you ever hear all these types of criticisms from Python about the gill, it doesn't apply to you. It applies to Python programmers. You can release it. So, basically the point is that this module, this is just a shared library. You have to do some magic to get your code from here to here. But once you're here, this is just actual C++ code. So whatever efficiencies you can get here in C++, you can get here too, because as long as this tiny hop is not the thing slowing you down, you're going to be fine. So. Let me kind of just mention really quickly sort of some advantages here. You know, what are the advantages to do this sort of thing? Well, if you want to make the code, you know, like in our example, fast, an advantage could be speed. If you want to do uh, concurrent, if you want to look at, into your concurrencies, you know, issues, maybe you, this is coming from, from the Python perspective. Let's say we start with this logistic regression class written in Python, and we want different parts to run concurrently. Or you just have some other type of application, you want pieces to run concurrently. 
you can take the parts that you want to run concurrently, move them into C++, turn them into a module, and then after that, you can control that concurrency from within Python, as long as you're releasing the GIL. So you don't even have to think about the concurrency that much. For example, if the, concurrent, the problem of the concurrency is something that you don't really want to deal with C++, so you just want the same thing to be running at the same time, then don't even make the C++ part concurrent. Just release the GIL, and then just run it over and over again within Python. You have that flexibility. So now another advantage is they have a control over memory. Uh, I haven't shown you that yet, but you know, with Python, Python has all this overhead for the different objects that you go, but C++, as we know, you don't have that. So you can take the parts that you want to control, you can move them into C++, and then the rest of the parts that you don't care, it's just plumbing anyway, you can leave them in Python. So let's look at some disadvantages. Well, there's multiple languages. That's terrible a lot of the time. I'm doing that in a job today, and I almost had, was slamming my head into the table dealing with multiple languages. And it's just hard. Passing data back and forth. That might be a problem both as a you know, computational you know, machine problem, but it can also be a problem from the perspective of having to constantly think about data in two different contexts. That's kind of the multiple language problem. Building and deployment can be complicated. If you get good at understanding how these shared libraries you know, stand together, then it's actually not that bad. In fact, I would say basically everyone in this room, if you know how to deploy C++ code, you will, you will know how to deploy Python code. But that doesn't mean that your users necessarily understand all that. And especially if they want to use it from a Python perspective, they usually just don't understand the, the shared libraries as well because that's not their job. And even if you do understand them well, there's still a huge amount of pain points. So, I mean, I think the big point is that, you know, good engineers can't think about multiple things at once, and they know that. Not that they can't think it and they don't know that. that that'll be a really dangerous engineer. But the ones that know that they should not be thinking about two things at once, uh, that's, that's basically just knowing your limits. And really, what you want to do is you have kind of a Python context, and you have like a C++ context, and then you have some boundary between them, and you want to keep things as separated as you possibly can. That's the only way to keep track of things in your head. So that comes at a cost, though, because the more separation you have, you're going to be doing some serialization and deserialization, and that takes time. So you might want that. You might not want that. So let's look for a second and say, how long does it take for data to be you know, passed back and forth between function calls? So I'm just going to kind of give one little example here. Hopefully my luck hasn't run out. So what my uh, new module does is I have a function this time, not a class. It's called noop because it's a noop. And I am releasing the gil because why not? But basically, I'm just taking this function, compiling this, exporting it into Python. I really did check that it's not getting optimized away, uh, and it's not. And uh, if I run, if I compile this, and then I look at my um, profiler, let's go. So uh, what I'm doing here is I am, a payload is just a list of a bunch of floating point numbers. Payload of size 1,000 is basically 1 to 1,000. Um, what I then do is I call this noop on the payload, because if we look at the actual noop function, oops, let's not mess that up. If we look at this noop function, it's taking a standard vector, which, by the way, I'm about to call it on a Python list, and PyBind11 just magically makes that happen and work. But a list in Python is going to have to become an actual standard vector. So the question is, how fast does this happen? Now, let's see. So with a payload of size 100, I am getting about 400, you know, almost 500,000 calls a second. This is uh, bytes per second. I don't know why I'm saying that, but uh, so it's this. These numbers are actually about half of what they are when I don't run in front of you and I have bad luck. 
but um, the point is that this is, you know, a lot of calls. Like, you should realize that the actual latency in these calls is not very much. Now, I'm calling the exact same thing over and over again, and so the cache is really working to our favor. So if you're doing some sort of a very randomized thing, it wouldn't work out this well. But the point is that, you know, depending on what your problem is, if you're only jumping across Python this interface a couple times, if you're not doing that in your deepest loop, it doesn't matter. So just kind of food for thought. Realize that you can use this. Now, another question is, do we have to pass data around? So, I mean, we don't want to use pass data around. We don't have to. The reason why we have to pass data around before is because Python has this list, and a list in Python is actually a long, it's basically the equivalent of a vector in C++, except that it's not storing these uh, longs, or maybe doubles in this case, inside the vector. It's, it's storing a reference to, the long, to this double object inside the vector. So it's the equivalent of, you know, if you store uh, strings inside a C++ vector, then you're really storing basically a pointer to the data because the data is variable length. But in Python, that's happening every single time, including this with a double. And so what we really want is we want our data to be typed stuck in a block of memory inside Python, and then we want to access it from C++. So, if we do that, let's look here. Actually, let me first show you, uh, let's see, the, the test uh, right here. Uh, actually, no, let's not show you that one. So the only difference here, and this one actually is kind of annoyingly different. So ignore this stuff on the top from the beginning. Before I was just getting my, you know, LR colon colon logistic regression class. This time I have some wrapper. Okay, I have some logistic regression wrapper, which is what I was up there. If I look at what's going on here, it's a bunch of ugly stuff, but it's actually pretty straightforward. Is that I'm telling this this is the actual public method for the, oh sorry, uh, right here. This is the compute coefficients method. And I'm telling it that I'm getting a pi array type of double, as a reference, you know, uh, pi array type of long for the minus one and the plus ones as x and y. And what I'm now doing is I'm just grabbing pointers to the beginning and the end of the data. And then I'm passing in these pointers. So by the way, I could just continually pass these pi array longs into my lr.cpp class. I could do that. The reason I'm not doing that is because I don't want my lr.cpp class to know anything about pi bind 11. I want that one to be very separated. Okay? That's just a design choice, but that's just because I want to look at lr.cpp and not think about pi bind 11. And so, but the point is that this is just uh, an array of data. If we look at this, which now had to change, this is the only time we really had to change this class, is that I now give it you know, a beginning and an end, and these are just pointers to longs and doubles. Uh, if we look down into the, this part still actually doesn't really have to change, it's only this part here. If I look at this a reduction function, then the only thing you should kind of pay attention to is that uh, the way that the data is stored is that I have the x values as pairs, and it happens to be one, then the next, and then like two of them, and then two of them, and then two of them. And so you have to know this. And so in this case, this doesn't actually matter that much. The, the actual C++ code doesn't know that much about what's going on. But it does know something. You know, this is now uh, kind of cognitively, you know, philosophically, tied to a certain data structure. You can hide that a little bit in different ways, and there's a bunch of ways you could kind of like try to do it. But at the end of the day, the point is that you now are tied to the specific data structure that NumPy has decided on. NumPy, in the, this case, is not so bad, but it's you know slightly more complicated than just having maybe just a vector of pairs or something. And multiply these slightly more complicated things by like 20 different interface locations, and then you can have something that's actually complicated. So there is a cost here, but as a plus, you're not actually 
copying data anymore. And so I want to kind of show you a way to sort of prove that. And uh, let me check one thing really quickly. Okay, good. I'm going to have space. Um, this is going to be, what are you doing? Oh, okay, I already built it. Okay, I got to be careful here. We're going to go to GDB. So I am calling GDB. All right, you see, I'm calling GDB on my Python interpreter. Okay? This is going to be really confusing because I have an interpreter on an interpreter. So I'm running this. Look at that. Print. Hello. Cool. Great. Uh, but I want to know where I am. So I'm going to do interrupt signal. Excellent. Where? I'm in some part of the interpreter. Excellent. What I want to do is I want to verify that when I enter into my lr.cpp function, I'm actually not copying my data. That's my goal. Okay? And I'm going to do it by being you know, a programmer. So if you work in a car and you want to ask yourself, can I put water in the engine of my car and run my car, then how do you figure that out? You probably ask somebody. Because putting water into the engine of your car, if it breaks your car, is really bad. But you're a programmer. That's not how you do it. For a programmer to figure out if your system's doing something, you throw grenades in every direction and just see what breaks. Because it doesn't matter. You just start it over again. So what we're going to do is we're not going to read the source code. Because who reads source code? We're not going to read the documentation because that lies anyway. I mean, I never write it. So what we're going to do is we're going to do something that's going to be able to verify this. Okay? Please let me know that this is going to work. Okay, so this is what we want to do. And this is actually totally super confusing. So I have right here, oops, let me try to do this. What's going on here? Oh, I was using uh, TMUX on my computer at work, which does not have the same number. So what I want to do is I'm going to look at my C extension. And uh, let me make this uh, bigger because this is worthless. I want to go into compute coefficients, and this right here is line 14. Okay, this is the func this is the, the the code that I use to compute this. So what I'm going to do, I'm inside GDB. I'm going to set a breakpoint at lr.cpp on line 14. Make breaking point future shared library load. Yes. Now, why did it ask me that? It asked me that because I have not imported this yet. So if I go like this info breakpoints. It just says address is pending. It hasn't been imported yet. Now I want to get into the Python interpreter. So continue. Cool. Now I'm in Python. Now let's go like this. Import LR CPP. That worked. Let's do a, uh, an interrupt to kind of make sure we're you know, on the same page. Info breakpoints. Boom. This thing is, it actually found this line of code. So this is good. Let's go back into Python. This is why it's so confusing. Now, what I want to do is I want to create a model, uh, lrcpp.logistic regression. I have this model. But I want to run this on some data. But I want to see if the data is being copied. So let me go back. Print get PID. This tells me the PID of the process that GDB is currently instrumenting. So this is the Python process. So now if I go and I look over here, and I go htop process 17036. That thing right there, let me make it big and look for one second. Well, I don't feel like going over, but it says, maybe I will Let's see. Oh, sorry, I was pretty lazy. Command is Python 3. So this is all good. It's looking good. Now, the number that we're looking at right now is we have this, we have our virtual memory and we have the memory that's resident, which, you know, is kind of confusing. But the point is we want to make these numbers get bigger. So if we go back into Python now, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue. So I'm back in the interpreter. I import data. 
I want to generate X and Y, and I'm going to say data dot generate data. This time I want to be very careful the number zeros. 10, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, okay. Keep on. By the way, the fact that I chose one third and one third is totally I did it a long time ago, so the picture would look nice, and then ever since then I just keep doing it because I'm afraid to do other numbers. Okay. So let's look at this. We have our resident and we have our virtual. Numbers are going up, numbers are going up. This is terrifying. I think it's going to crash the video. Didn't crash it. Okay, right now we have 2114 megabytes resident. Okay, and now what I'm going to do is I have my X, I have my Y, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to call it. Okay, this thing should immediately break into the debugger when it answers the code. And what I want you to do is just watch that resident right there. Oh, let's see. Taking a long time. Wait a minute, it went up. Okay, weird. Let's return. And if you remember in the code, I'm returning and I'm sending back garbage data, which is why, and then this, I'm gonna return early. Continue, that's the garbage data. Okay. But now look at it, 2095. It's back low again. So this is all all continually making you think that I'm actually a charlatan. But this time, I'm ready for it. So, another thing is that, did you see how long that just took? That didn't do any computation. That was like, that was like three function calls. So what's going on? Data is obviously being copied. Something is happening. Like, why the hell is this happening? And this is not actually me kind of doing this as a lesson to you guys. I started this, doing this at, at home to verify that this wasn't copying, and then it is copying, and what's going on? Well, what's going on is if, you return now, continue, look at type X, I'm calling that with a list. I don't want to print it because it's about eight zillion things. But if I look at what I did when I generated it, ah, I wasn't using the right function. I was actually generating it. I was just generating the list as before, types of just um, a list of a bunch of pairs of floats. If I do the NP version, you look what happens. I now have X and Y. I actually have way less memory because this is much more compact. These are now NumPy arrays. If I call these right now, boom, instantaneous, no actual jump in memory. So, I hope this actually blows your mind, because what this means is that not only is PyBind 11 doing all this magic for us behind the hood, but we just, we just threw the wrong crap at it, and it's like, no problem, I'll just use that, and it did it for you. So that's really cool. Now in our case, it was actually total backfire, because we were trying to do it uh, in a way that it wouldn't just handle everything for us, but the point is that, well, we can fix it if we know what we're doing. So, Anyway, this is just some sort of long way of kind of showing you that Python can send this data and actually access it from inside. And if you do it, and at least very toy examples that aren't too complicated, it's not necessarily so bad. So let me continue out of there. Oh, shh, no, I don't want that. That's gonna take so long. Okay, so the answer to that is no. So basically now, we're kind of at the, the home stretch here, is that, you know, for this type of a thing to work, you have these design questions, which are basically, where should data reside? Where should execution occur? So in my case, I keep on having the actual data sitting in <coughs> Python. I wouldn't do it in this way if, in the, for myself, if I were actually writing this. What I would do is, for the Python, for the actual C++ class, I would expose some sort of a pushback method or something like that. And then I would just send the data all the way into the C++ class and let it own it. Because in that case, I would still have all my parallelization. I would still go, I don't, I don't need to have it running um, separately in Python and C++. Uh, or at least I don't need to have that data accessible within Python. 
But that's a design choice. It's a question of what you want to do. Where do you want this data to reside? And if you choose to have it in Python, maybe you want it accessible, do you, can you accept copies? Now you have execution. You know, should the execution and the data basically be next to each other, or should they kind of be separate? I mean, if there's a lot of data and you constantly are moving it around and the execution is fast, then you're kind of in like this situation where you should really be doing some sort of a MapReduce-like thing where you're moving execution to data. And if you're, you're in that type of a problem, then that affects your design. So there's no answers to it. It's just in general, you just have to think about it. But um, basically, kind of as like you know, a conclusion, the point is that you can, com you can compile whatever C++ you want as long as you're willing to put that thing you know, not in your, you know, as long as you, this object that you're compiling, putting in Python is not in the deepest loop, or is not somehow something that has to be called from within C++, then you are golden. So, yeah, basically, I think that more people should consider doing it, and that's it, yeah. So, uh, what happened if you uh, didn't uh, so when I was operating, so when I released the lock, okay, so that's actually a really good question. And uh, not to say that that's kind of a bad way of putting it, but uh, it's a great question. All questions are great. But actually, if we look at this example here, and um, I'm just going to run this. So this is actually the, um, this is this simple example, the no op module, okay? This thing does release the global interpreter lock. Now if I profile it with the pi threads, um, so this is actually kind of a bad example because all of these different threading examples are giving really weird numbers today. But the point is that you will never make more threads make this go faster. And the reason is because the only thing that actually occurs in this is a conversion. That conversion, even though you're not doing it, it's taking this list of data and it's converting it into uh, a standard vector, that's using all the Python API calls. So even though the global interpreter lock is released, it's not being released until after all those API calls have already been done and you've fully finished your conversion. And so in the other case, when we were doing it, we were releasing it. We were never, um, we don't release the lock in any situation until after we leave the interpreter. So when we're in the interpreter and we're doing all these conversion situations, those are all fine. So you're not actually going to step on each other's feet. You're not going to cause any concurrency issues because you're holding the lock at that point. But that's really important because it means that you cannot get anything um, like you will, you have sort of, anytime you're in the interpreter, you have almost on those log going on, and so you're not going to actually be able to um, get anything out of there unless you're corrupting your data, which you will in like two seconds because it, it's like race conditions everywhere if you remove the global interpreter log. But uh, yeah. Yeah? So I think one question is that why in your C code that even how many strides that matter you have the same performance? Yeah, that's, that shouldn't be happening. If that's a problem because you hold the global log, if you check your C++ code. No, 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 no. So it's, that's, yeah, that, that's, not, that's not the problem. That's not the problem. Those, those graphs don't make sense. In fact, I bet you, if, like, I think the only thing that makes sense is that maybe this video program is actually, like, freaking it out because I've never seen it like that. No, I mean, and just uh, if you see your C++ code, that should only protect uh, this uh, incremental uh, data in the end. But you, you have this log gap holding the whole algorithm, so it's... No, no, no. I mean, this is right here. <clears throat> this look right. Oops. You got a in the log, in three editions. Yeah. You should have a bracket around the log and this uh, following three line. No, no, it only covers three of them. It's only covering the rest of the block. So this is right, uh... I don't think we can check. Yeah. Uh, This this lock is only is only starting at that point in the actual function. Okay, don't. Okay, yeah. That's not, that log is not uh, holding the global. Yeah, it's not. I mean, this law this is the this is the actual lock up here, but it's yeah, not being it's held. Globally, yeah. It's not it's not being held until down here. 
you should definitely put a, a bracket around the poly and pole lines. No, you don't. It won't. It won't change it. No. I'll do, I can do it right now. We can do it, but like it won't change it. Okay, if you don't do it, I mean, it will hold in for the whole globe. So you have to do it. it no, because the constructor's not being called until you get to that line. It's not actually grabbing it no, until you get there. The, when you construct it, it will be called. Yeah, it's only almost from the constructor to the scope end. So don't hold it for those three double additions. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's when you run in the scope, but the stack will create all the objects. This is not actually uh, a good example because this is not working the way it should anyway. So, uh, <laughs> in fact, if it really worked right now, then I would be, s I would lose my mind. But then this was probably going to actually show some nonsense again, which doesn't contradict you. Well, that's how C++ works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, like this doesn't, you know, support me. This is like, I have garbage twice, therefore I'm right because it's consistent. <laughs> but, um, but, uh, <laughs> like, you know, like, but, but no, so both of them do do it the same. Um, we can pull out the standard, but, which I never read, but, uh, oh, sorry. But then the point is, but yeah, like, he's right. It does, at that point, it'll be for the rest of it. And it, it will hold for the rest of the scope, but it will not hold it for that. And if I actually turn off the video recorder, we come back here, I promise you, we're going to see some graphs that look much better. Uh, it's full car, so you see it decreased with... Uh, it did decrease in the beginning, that's right. Yeah. So this one is like, if I could ignore all the other ones, this is the best one. Yeah. But it's still pretty garbage. Can we come back to me? Turn off the recording now, yep. because we are late this time. Okay. And we split a serial people's question. Come here, the rest can spread out the sickness a little bit to drink. Uh, still available. And we uh, chill out the evening. Yes, and thanks for this great talk. Okay. Thank you.